Hi, um, welcome to this New Schools Network event. I'm Sophie Harrison Byrne. I'm the director um, at the charity. Thank you very much for making the time to attend this event. Um, I really hope that you find it valuable. A few bits of housekeeping. Um, you should have got a notification to let you know that this event is being recorded, um, just so you are aware. If I could ask um, people to turn their videos on um, where possible and to put themselves on mute um, whilst our speakers are delivering their content, there will be an opportunity um, for questions um, towards the end of the session. Um, but please do feel free to pop any that occur to you um, as we go along in the chat and then um, our facilitators can um, parcel them out to, uh, to people to answer as we go. Um, as you may well know, this is the last in a series of events for Principal Designates that we have delivered in partnership with um, the Department for Education over the last few years. Um, the recording of this will be available um, on YouTube, so you will be able to dip back in and out of it um, as your free school journey progresses. Um, this session really focuses on the first 100 days um, of headship of a new school, so a very um, unique and special experience in our country to be one of the few um, leaders who will be setting up a new state school from scratch and those um, first days will be really important to you and I'm sure you're um, uh, looking forward to them with excitement but possibly a little bit of trepidation too. Um, so this session is really to help you um, embrace that opportunity and prepare um, as much as you possibly can um, in the run up to that. Um, and I'm absolutely uh, delighted to introduce Sir David Carter, um, who will be uh, leading the majority of the session. Um, Sir David, um, as I'm sure many of you uh, will know, um, began his teaching career in the 1980s and over the next 30 years um, had ver many various roles, including a local authority music advisor, head teacher, executive head teacher and CEO. Um, in 2016, Sir David was appointed to the post of National Schools Commissioner and in 2018 became Executive Director of System Leadership at Ambition Institute. Um, and for those of you um, that aren't aware and haven't read it, um, he published a book um, in 2020 about um, Academy Trust leadership, leading Academy Trusts, while some fail, but most don't. Um, and to recognise all of that contribution to the system, um, Sir David was knighted for services to education in 2013 um, and Sir David has very kindly run um, this and some of the sessions for us um, over the years um, and you're in for a, a real treat. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over um, yeah. to Sir David. Thank you so much. Sophie, that's a lovely introduction and very kind. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, really nice to have the chance to spend some time with you. Um, and, and I guess share some thoughts and reflections on this challenge of the first 100 days of headship in a new school. Um, a lot of the work that I do today is uh, with leaders in schools, in trusts, people starting out on new roles, being appointed into new roles. So some of the things I want to share with you are based upon my own journey, but also based on the journey that, uh, that I've shared and seen happening uh, around the country. So a massive well done to you on taking on the role that you have. Uh, and I hope the next few minutes that we spend together will, will, will be useful and that the slides that I prepared are, are going to be helpful. So um, I thought what I'd start with is, is by uh, just talking about this from the perspective of it being a bit of a route map. Uh, I think that's how I see the, the, the reason why I like the 100 days model and why I talk a lot about that is that 100 days is basically half an academic year. It takes you from September to February half term. And then it takes you from February half term to the end of the academic year. And what, one of the challenges I think that we have when we when we think about improvement planning and we're thinking about writing our strategic plans is that rightly so, people expect us to write them for three years, four years, five years, whatever it might be. But actually schools change much more quickly than that. They, they, they're, they're vibrant places where the culture is everything. And so I think it's also useful to have a, a route map in your back pocket of what the 100 day unit looks like as well in, in terms of that. So it's that that I really want to focus upon uh, as we think about moving towards the start of the next academic year. So on the next slide, um, I, I've set out what I think are the, the, the five things that if, if I was coaching you or mentoring you, um, what would be the things I'd expect us to talk about between now and maybe this time next year? So one would be 
that by the point of the 100 days, you'd have that first draft of your development plan. Um, and, and you might think it's curious to say, well, why wouldn't I not have one in September? Um, because the, from my perspective, in September, you have some intentions and some ideas of what you'd like to deliver. But until your school becomes a, leaving, a living, breathing organisation with people in it, uh, it's sometimes quite hard to do that. So I think by the time you get to uh, February, March next year, 2023, that's the point at which you have the beginning of that draft that says, okay, this is where we think we're going. This is what we now know to be true. This is what we know to be the culture of our organisation. Um, and hopefully that will take a little bit of pressure off because sometimes you'll feel that you have to produce these complex documents ahead of opening, which the DFE will obviously expect you to do some of that. But in terms of what actually happens in the school, I think you need to take your time very carefully and work out what it is that you need to do and what the opportunities are that, that you have in front of you. The second goal for me is about communicating your expectations. So sort of what, what do you care about? What do you believe in? almost what are your non-negotiables so that people understand you both as a leader and as a person, but also how as a leader you develop the culture of your school. The third goal is how you get to know your community, your staff, your students and the people around you. Um, how the people that you're leading get to know a bit about you. Um, it's, it's a strength to talk about your your own priorities. It's a strength, I think, to talk about you and your journey that gets you to headship, about your family, about the things that you're excited about, about your interests and your hobbies outside school to, to build that sort of sense of knowledge about being a person as well as a school leader. But also to think about finally how you gather as much information about the people that you're going to be leading and how they respond to your leadership. Because the people that you employ, the people that you have around you, will, be, will have worked for other people in the past they'll have a track record they'll have successes they'll have failures um, and understanding the nuances of that conversation i think are really important there's a quote which i use on the next slide which i which i've used for over 20 years now um, and it's this one the greatest danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short but in setting our aim too low and achieving our, our mark and i i think that call to arms around ambition is really powerful um, and very very important um, and, and even more so, I think, in a school that's brand new, um, because when you're taking on a school that already has a legacy, you're building upon the legacy that you've been handed uh, and all of the things that have happened before you arrive in a school that's, that's been around for some time. But actually, you have an opportunity here to be really fiercely ambitious about the community that you serve in a way that is slightly different. To, us, to an established school. And I think that quote, which uh, I came across many years ago, I've, I've used it in presentations and I used to have it on the wall in my office as a reminder to me about, you know, if, if I don't feel ambitious for my community, if I don't feel that my school is special, then it's going to be an outstanding contributor to the education sector, then who else is going to do that for me? So, so, so it, it's around that. So what I wanted to do next, for the next couple of slides, is to think a bit about the priorities that we have as school leaders. Um, but I think particularly yeah, what I want to try to get the balance in the, ne in the next bit of the presentation is between, yes, there needs to be some big picture thinking around that. But I also think there needs to be some nitty gritty stuff around how do we think about uh, what we do in those 100 days to answer those questions that I just posed on the slide before last. So if we go to the first slide in this, the, the priorities for me are around this triangle, this pyramid. Um, and, and you'll see that what I've done is I've put improvement and impact in the centre. So, of course, as a leader, your, your job is to deliver great standards and a great education for the children that are at your school. But it's not just about that. And it's not simple as that, because school improvement, um, at whatever part of the journey you're on, whatever trajectory your school is on, it is messy and chaotic at times. It's not simple. It's not a linear process. Um, and you sometimes have to move forward three steps and then go back a couple of steps and then retrace your footsteps and go again. So the improvement and impact is obviously the ultimate goal that we want for our school. But I think there are three C's here that really help you to do that. Number one is capacity, which I put at the top of the pyramid. And, and this is the capacity capacity which I think falls into three three areas there's a there is a intellectual capacity about the people that you have around you who understand how to improve schools and and their unique contribution so your role as the head teacher is to think about the entire improvement focus of your school but if I'm head of English or I'm head of key stage two 
then I have to be brilliant at that aspect. And, and my contribution as a head of a subject or a head of a, of a key stage enables me to make that one contribution to the totality of my organization. So capacity is one really big issue about what, what is the intellectual capacity of how people know how to improve their, their part of the school that you're leading. The second element of capacity is around uh, time. And and you you get this opportunity in a new school once really, which is to think about how do you want your colleagues to spend their time? How do you do something quite unique around workload, for example, um, by, by being really clear about how many hours you want to devote to different activities? If we think about this nationally at the moment, the, the average working week uh, is around about 56 to 57 hours in secondary and primary. And if you think about the reality that probably 22 to 23 of those hours are spent actually in front of children in the classroom, it really does beg the question, what, what's happening in the other 34, 35 hours of the week? And, and we as leaders have an opportunity to engage in that and think about that. And then the third element of the capacity triangle is, is resource, the, the financial resource to do the things you want to do. And you can't, you can't spend the same pound twice. So, so there will be opportunities for you to think differently about how you spend your resource and thinking about where you want to make your priority in terms of your revenue and, and that to get the maximum capacity to raise standards for the children at your school. My second C is in the bottom left hand corner and I use the word collaboration. Um, uh, and in another presentation that I give, uh, I've talked about collaboration being the oxygen of school improvements, and I, I fiercely believe that's the case. I think when we think that there are 22,000 schools in England, primary and secondary and across the entire sectors, it's very easy to, 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 to think that we have to to start every challenging conversation from scratch. Every strategy has never been revisited before, and of course it has. So who are your networks going to be? Who are you going to work alongside? How are you gonna capitalize upon what NSN are able to provide for you and the group that's on this call this morning as a resource? Who do you collaborate with to make your role uh, easier so that, that you learn from others, but you also share your learning with others for them as well? And then the third C is around civic responsibility. Um, and what I mean by this is the way that educational leaders, I think, need to join forces with leaders in other public sectors in other charities and in other businesses in the third sector and, and private sector as well, because the closing of the educational gap that we now see in this country, uh, which was pretty challenging before COVID, but has become even more difficult. I don't think educational leaders can solve this on their own. I think we have to think about who our partners are going to be in this. So for me, that civic responsibility about how do we not just lead our school, but lead our community, but talk to people with responsibility for looking at mental health, talk to people who are in social care, talk to people who are working in housing, talk to people who are working in the youth justice system to, to build a picture of how education fits in your part of society that makes a, a lasting difference. And, I, and I, that, that for me is really the ultimate big picture. And I'd be surprised if in a year's time, when you're thinking about the draft of that improvement plan, that those three uh, C's are not part of maybe the structure that you might think about. So if I go to my next slide, I think there are four challenges that we, uh, that we need to address to underpin some of the things I've said. So one is about that disadvantage gap. And I've described this as the biggest civil rights challenge that we face, because by the time children go to reception at the age of four, they are already, if they're disadvantaged, behind the gap. And by the time they get to the age of 11 and the age of 16 and the age of 18, that gap is seismic. Um, and it's how we see some of the real challenges that we face in society today. Um, yeah, we, we have the responsibility to work with others to try to do something about that. So having that at the focal point, I think, uh, of, your, of your thinking as a head about your school can only really be as successful, in my view, as it will be with the most vulnerable child you have. That's quite a challenge, isn't it? So when we talk about, for example, I mean, we came through an era when I was ahead where target setting was king. Everybody talked about target setting and the DFE, when I was leading my academy trust in Bristol, wanted to know what our targets were for every year group in the school. And it always felt curious to me that when they asked me about my five A to C's with English and maths and I would tell them a target, give them a number. Even in doing that one target, I was basically saying that there's a proportion of children in my school who are not in that reach. So if we think that 70%, 80% is a good target for five A to C's with English and maths back in the day when it was, people might be impressed by the ambition of that, but there are 20% of the children who are not included. 
So how do we think about the culture of when we talk about success? I think we have to talk about the weakest child, the most vulnerable family. If we see improvement through the lens of those people, I think we have a chance of doing something quite interesting around that. The second element is, is and it's true for the sector, but it's certainly true for you in a new school, is how do you judge a good school when there is no comparable data to use around it? So at the moment, the, the last year that we had in the sector of reliable comparable data was 2019. So this year, again, I think it's probably going to be a bit of a hybrid. So you're talking about possibly 2025 before we have a three year trend of data that we can trust. So what happens in the meantime that says we, we lead a good school? What are the metrics that you would rely upon to tell an external observer that your school is successful? The third challenge is that point I made about collaboration a moment ago about purposeful collaboration. How do we do that? How do we hardwire schools across the sector to, to work together better? And then that third one is my, my third C on the previous side about, about working as civic leaders and thinking beyond our schools and our trusts. And I think those are the four challenges that, that I see leaders across the sector today really wrestling with in a post-COVID world as we think about what, what the education system pivots back to. And then to help you with that, I thought I'd just share with you some of the, the things that I think our leaders need to be good at. Uh, and so if I look on the next slide, these are some of the things that I do with my work at Ambition, uh, some of the work that I do on some of the coaching that I, that I do with trust leaders, CEOs and head teachers. These are kind of the six anchors, I think, about what successful leader is. Now, now, you will already be exhibiting a lot of this because you've been successful and you're ahead. But this for me is not is, is less about you personally and more about the modelling that you do for others. So one of the things that we do as leaders is we create new leaders by making the leadership role that we do and that they're interested in feel possible. And so when we model this, when we, when we walk the talk, when we're, when we're presenting, when we're in our staff meetings, when we're in our one-to-one -one conversations, when we're giving feedback to people, these are some of the things that I think we exhibit as strengths uh, in the school leadership landscape today. So be, be ethical about your, about your leadership. Think about how you really focus upon culture and values. You can't create a culture by telling people how to behave. You create the culture as a product of the behaviors. The, the culture of your school will be the aggregate of the values and behavior that you see every day. How do you lead people? Um, and, and when things are going well, it's the best job in the world. But as leaders, we, we really make our mark by helping people through challenging times. So when lessons aren't strong, when the curriculum isn't good enough, when, when outcomes aren't where we want them to be, how do we have those difficult conversations and build people so that they're able to become better versions of their professional selves? How do we lead collaboration, which then leads to school improvement? And then when you move on from your role that you're about to take on to your next role, somebody will come in and take your school over. And that's the legacy part. That's how you leave your school in a really successful position in four, five, six years time, whenever that might be for your success to take the school to the next level. And I think we do it through looking at two intelligences. Um, and what I've done on this slide here, the next slide, is to think a little bit about what I, what I, what I call these multiple intelligences. Um, now, on the right hand side, you'll see the, the term emotional intelligence, which you'll be very familiar with from a lot of Daniel Goldman, um, amongst others, work on thinking about how, particularly how your leadership uh, impacts on other people. How do you help other people make sense of what it is you're asking them to do? How do you communicate with them? How do you feedback to them? How do you describe the future that you're leading the school towards? Really, really important stuff. But if you only do the emotional intelligence well, then I think there's a challenge. And that challenge for me is, is mitigated by what I call on the left, the operational intelligence, which is how do you understand and become really good agents of change? How do you lead change well? How do you build a group of people around you who know how to do some of the transactional elements of school improvement? So uh, whether it's people that are really good at managing and developing behavior, really good at improving the quality of teaching, really good at curriculum design, you need that expertise around the table with you so that you've got that blend of, this is how we're gonna make this the best school in the country, alongside this is how we're gonna make it the best place in the country to work because you blend the two together that's when you get that really powerful uh, I think cultural root about we understand 
not only what we need to do to become a great school, but we also know how we're going to do it. And me as an individual, I know what my job is. You've explained to me how you want me to function and how you're going to judge my performance. And when you get the blend of those two things right, that's the sweet spot. So if we go to the next slide, there will come a point, as I said, in the first 100 days where people are rightly going to ask you, what is the strategy? What is the plan that, that, you're, that you're working on? And this might just be helpful in terms of thinking about why you build this. So I always start at the base of this pyramid with the word mission. And I think sometimes we have a degree of confusion between what we mean by the word mission and what we mean by the word, the word vision, because I think they're different. So for me, the mission is about the, the fundamental reason as to why your school or your organization exists. And then the vision is the translation of that mission into how are we gonna do that then? How are we going to deliver that ambition? What's the destination going to be? And that's why I think having a mission statement is really important. And that then flows into that three-year vision plan I talked about earlier on. But a three-year plan, particularly in a new school where every year for the next four or five years, you're going to have new year groups, new staff, Three years is too long a period of time. So you need, I think, the 100-day strategy of the priorities that you're going to work on between September and February and then February to July, almost for the next five years as you build up that vision. So when you're thinking about your vision and what it is you want to accomplish, I would link every one of the object objectives to a 100-day plan somewhere in the four or five-year cycle that you're going to do. So just to give you an example of that, when, when I was the, um, the founding CEO of the Cabot Learning Federation in Bristol, the mission that we articulated for ourselves was to be the champion of vulnerable children in East Bristol. That was the kind of the goal. That's why we set the trust up. Because at that time in Bristol, 2007, there was a large influx of families from Afghanistan, from Somalia, and from parts of Eastern Europe. And East Bristol, which had, apart from the, the Afro-Caribbean community um, around the St. Paul's area, was largely a white working class community. And that was a challenge for us in terms of how we adapted uh, our thinking to that. And the vision for us was, so one of the challenges that those young people face arriving in Bristol with little English was, was literacy and oracy. And, and how, if you're a 14 year old, are you going to be able to understand a GCSE question in two years time? So our vision was about how do we think about increasing our capacity to help children read better and, and, and become more literate? And then the strategy was hand over to the schools you know your children better than the trust does. How are you going to create a literacy strategy or, or, or a strategy in your English departments that's going to help those young, young people understand not just the language, but how they need to interpret that to, to write and to be able to appreciate what an, an exam question is asking them. And so when you think about your, your strategy through the lens of mission, vision, strategy, your values then lock onto that. And so the values that are important to you personally, that become an extension of you as individuals, become part of the culture of your school. So if that's where I want to just pause on the big picture stuff, um, I want to talk now for the, the rest of the presentation about what some of the detail is around this. So on the next slide, these are some of the challenges that I think um, I've said that nobody tells you, but I'm sure by now they have told you about it. And if not, you've worked it out for yourself. But these are the challenges that all new heads face. Um, first of all, what everyone else thinks about your new school. So in the early days of the free school policy, uh, when I was regional schools commissioner for the Southwest, and we were approving free schools uh, across that part of, the, part of the country, it was really difficult at times to engage other heads in this who saw a new school on their patch as a threat. Now, I think that's been diluted to an extent because some of the free schools that we see across the country now, some of the best schools that we have in the system, but there will still be a perception, as you'll be aware, about what people think about the, your new school. The second challenge is going to be that the children that you hope are going to turn up on day one actually will, because obviously you're predicting and you're planning your budgets, you're planning everything really about an intake that you believe to be secure. And I'm sure, given that we're now in March that and, and that the, the school offers have gone out, um, I'm sure that will be a much clearer picture than it would have been before Christmas. The third one is about the people that you appoint. Um, and and the why is it that people want to apply to work in a brand new school? And what is it that they think that will offer them? And what will they offer you around that? How do you really establish those consistent expectations about how people will behave? And I don't mean behavior just in the, in the pure sense of that word, but the behaviors 
between each other. If you think about it, there are three pivotal relationships in schools. There's a relationship from adults to adults. There's a relationship from adults to children. And there's a relationship between children and children. And, and those are parts of that cultural expectation I talked about. How do you build the consistency of expectation in your first 100 days that gives you the chance of building the foundations for the future? And then how do you engage with parents? How do you, how do you get that sense of excitement that they have about sending their child to a new school, tempered by the slight nervousness that the school has no track record to fall back upon? Um, and some parents will be excited by that and some will be slightly daunted by that. And, and your communication then will be really, really important. But having said all of that, I think on the next slide, I've articulated what I think are some of the really big prizes that are worth fighting for. Um, this is your school. You, you don't have to come in and overturn a legacy that somebody else has created. You don't have to listen to people say, well, we tried that before and it didn't work then. This is your school and your chance. This is a vision that's based upon what you've learned and what you believe to be important. You've got the chance to build a culture that puts your school at the heart of its community. And the first generation of children that start with you in September, they become your alumni of the future. You know, you, you're, you're doing something quite unique, whether they're four year olds or 11 year olds, um, whatever situation, whatever context they're coming into your school, you have an opportunity to change their lives in a way that, that others haven't had the chance to do yet. And that's a really, really important part of, of, of what for me is the free school policy and why it's been such a success in this country. So some tips, I guess, for the last couple of slides. Um, on my next slide, you'll have a view about this, uh, but I quite like the idea of keeping a personal journal. And, and what I mean by a personal journal is not, not something that turns into war and peace or, or a thesis. I'm just simply thinking of something that once a week, you set some time out to write down some bullets uh, under two headings. So you, get, you, have a, you have a notebook, you divide it in half. On the left-hand side is www, what went well. On the right-hand side, EBI, even better if. And you just reflect upon the week that you've had. Because when you're setting up something so new, the speed of change and the, the number of things that you'll be thinking about means that you will lose sight of how you did it when it's been done. And so I think the route map that you keep for the first couple of years that describes that journey uh, and, the, and your reflection on the decisions that you took and the things that you found difficult, I think is really important. Um, and for me is, is part of that creation of the culture of the school. And, and I think that that idea of being able to have some means of reflection through the first couple of years is a really important touch point in terms of the journey of the school. And, and when you're building um, your governance capacity, when you're appointing new staff, when you're thinking about um, people coming into your leadership team as your school gets bigger, it's a really important reflection, I think, to be able to describe the journey that you've been on that's going to inform the journey that you're about to start. On the next slide, I want to talk about stakeholders because we talked a bit about that before. And, and these for me are some of the stakeholders that you probably want to have a plan for. So when I talked about that 100 day plan of building the confidence of your community, and I've got in the back of my mind that phrase, you only get one chance to make that first impression. For me, these are the people that need to be on your state stakeholder map. Now, some of these are really obvious. So if I start at 12 o'clock with, with children and students, and I work around the clock face, the teaching staff, support staff, parents, governors, those are obvious people that you're going to be spending an awful lot of time with. But because they're obvious, sometimes we leave them out. So if you see support staff as really important stakeholders, you, you avoid the risk that you create a two tier system where you've got people who are teachers and people who aren't. We need to treat everybody the same and recognize the contribution that they make. You need to think about your stakeholders in terms of your other local schools in your community. The other networks that exist, the point I made earlier about some of the non-educational groups you might want to form a relationship with. The national networks, NSN is an obvious one, the DFE, the RSC uh, in your region will be an another that will want to know how your, how your journey is unfolding. As well as the partners that you choose, the people that you currently work with in your, in your previous roles that are really important to you, that you want to continue to network with as you go, go through. But having that concept of a stakeholder map of the people that you want to engage with when you're setting up something from scratch as you guys are I think is a really important element of that so the next one is it's quite granular but but I but I think it's quite powerful it's it's it's, it's the never forgetting the power of assemblies um, and one of the things I think it's useful to do as a new head is to do as many of them as you can 
um, and, and remembering that assemblies are as much for the children as they are for the adults. Uh, and I remember very, very much in my early days of headship and, and particularly as I got more experience and took on more responsibility uh, and, and ran, running a trust, most of the assemblies I did with children in the schools in the Cabot Learning Federation uh, I was targeting my message to the people around the outside of the, of the assembly hall as much as I was the young people sitting in front of me. Um, and I thought this might just give you a, a structure, which is, uh, my, you know, you, you, you'll have a plan yourself for this. But when I've coached new heads, um, I've, I've, I've looked at it in this way. So uh, in week one and two, when your school starts up at the very beginning of September, um, and I'm, I'm not suggesting you necessarily have to do it every single week, um, but in that first fortnight, I think there's an assembly just just crying out to be done around your standards and expectations of children. What is it that you expect to see as you walk around your school? In weeks three and four, what do you like about your school and why did you want to be the leader of it? Um, and what have you seen in the first month that's really caught your imagination? In week five and six, as you kind of get towards half term, what do you want to do to improve the school? What are you going to ask the children to do in terms of their contribution and and how are you going to support them to do that and then finally just as you get towards that first half term which is now around about day 40 day 50 something like that how how are the students going to help you make that difference how do you engage the kids as being feeling part of this whole that they're part of the leadership team almost the leadership group that you have in your new school and and i've only gone up to half term and, and you may decide that that's enough to begin with but i think one of the successful things about the first 100 days is that you plan your key messages for your assemblies and your staff meetings ahead of time so you don't leave it to chance and so people are really clear about what those messages are and quite frankly if i was doing what you're about to do when i went into the second half term from october up to christmas i would just do the same cycle again i'd re i'd re reinforce my expectations i'd reinforce about what i like about the school i'd reinforce what the role of students is so that message by christmas Christmas is really well, 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 well embedded in the school. And so on the next slide, just thinking about children, thinking about how do we build those relationships with children. One of the great things about being ahead is when you walk around your school and, and you just see great stuff happening, great learning, great conversations, really, really successful things taking place. So I think you need to try to complete some form of a learning walk every day. Be really visible. Don't miss break times, lunch times or bus duties or whatever that social time is. Be out and about. Be, be visible. Be seen. Um, in, in Again, I used to do this all the time, but you may think it's too much to, to, to contemplate doing forever. But that idea of having lunch with children once a week, um, whether it's five kids or 10 kids, doesn't really matter the number. But you have a regular slot once a week where a group of children come and talk about being in your school. Um, I like the idea where you might ask a teacher or a group of teachers to send you their work of the week. So you start to get a picture of the quality of learning takes place. Of course, you may want to do book, book scrutinies as well, that's fine. But asking teachers to send you what they think the best work is they've seen tells you not only about the quality of the work that the children are doing, but also gives you an insight into what teachers think is quality. And it may not be what you think is. So it's quite an interesting dynamic to have that conversation. Um, if it's not insensitive, take photographs of the work and, and use those in your assemblies. So um, whether it's a particular piece of writing or a piece of artwork or, or something that you've been really blown away by, have a photograph of that. And in those assemblies, when you're talking about your expectations, flash them up on the screen, have about 20, 25 of them have on, on, on a loop. You don't need to talk about them. Just having them in the background when you're talking just reinforces a message about what you really value. And if I go on to my next slide and we think about that relationship building with staff, then some of the things I've already said, but I think it's just worth reiterating a couple of these, getting to know your team as people. Um, again, your diary will be under pressure in the first 100 days, but if you can try to commit to having a single one-to-one -one meeting with every member of staff by the time you get to the 100 days, it really counts because it's, it's an opportunity for everybody to get to know a little bit about you as a, as a head, but also for you to talk to them privately. So a 20-minute meeting with everybody to start off, I think is a really good one to do. I like the idea of pulse surveys. Um, I, I can see the value in doing one massive staff questionnaire annually. 
Um, but I think there's also power in just doing really short two or three questions, maybe five maximum, once a week to a group of people, um, and then the same pulse survey to a different group of people the following week. And of course, in your first 100 days, what you're asking them is, you know, is this thing working? What's working? What's not working? What, what, what's happening that we didn't think about that we need to engage with and get that kind of instant feedback? And that gives you that evidence as you lead up to your first inspection as well, because when you have your first inspection as a free school, you don't have the same backlog of data and previous inspections to fall back on. So you want to gather as much evidence as possible, whether it's feedback from children, from parents, from staff, about how they feel the school is going. And, and the last one is just a, a tip to help you manage your time, really, and take some pressure off your diary, is that when you're new, lots of people will want to ask you things and your, 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 your PA or your executive assistant or whatever you want to call that person will be inundated with people saying, can I just have 10 minutes with the head? And of course, A, it's never 10 minutes. And secondly, they'll, they'll start logging, log jamming your diary to give everybody the slot they want. If you have a staff surgery for an hour after school during the course of a week, where the maximum meeting is for 15 minutes, then actually you can see four people uh, every week and it helps people to prioritize whether they really need to see you or whether they could ask you their question on, on email for example so a staff surgery planned into your diary for people to be able to book into I think immediately takes a little bit of pressure off the day when you want to be doing your learning walks when you want to be meeting parents when you want to be looking at the work that children are doing because the danger is that you get locked back into your office and don't get the opportunity to be out and about and being the visible head I talked about the third group that are important about managing relationships with our parents. Um, and, and again, um, some tips around that one. So I used to, uh, as a new head, make four random phone calls a week to families. Um, I used to do it on a Friday, Friday after school, last thing before I went home. They, they, they used to get quite shocked because um, some parents want to know why the head's ringing them about their child. Um, and I was very quick to point out that child's done nothing wrong. I'm just asking you how things are for you as a parent. Um, and of course, you, you're never going to get to every parent. But if you do four a week um, and you've got the best part of 20, 20 weeks in your first 100 days, you're going to get between 80 and 90 bits of feedback. Um, and it's an opportunity for that one to one conversation between the parent and yourself about how the school is working and what they're hearing at home about what the child is saying. Um, the meet the principal, meet the head teacher half term the events, I think are really valuable. Um, it's an opportunity for you to feed back on some of the things that you're finding about the school, what you want to do with the school um, and engage people around that. Some of the most obvious local board govern, governing board members have come from some of those experiences in my if, for me. At the end of the first 100 days, that's probably where you do your first parents and carers questionnaire to get some kind of satisfaction and engagement. Again, I wouldn't keep, I wouldn't make it overly complicated to keep it really simple, but try to gauge some, some feedback from parents, particularly on the back of those phone calls and the meet the principal sessions. Um, and all of that helps to build up your evidence base for the RSC, the, the uh, Ofsted if, 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 their, if their inspection is looming, and, and anybody else who wants to know about how your school is developing. So it, it's, it's real, it's real evidence, it's not contrived, and it gives an opportunity to, for you to build that. And then my final group um, around building man relationships are trustees, governors, and the wider community. So obviously you'll have your own board of trustees. Um, and these, again, are just tips that I just find useful. Never be afraid to visit your governors in their workspace because they're going to be spending a lot of time in yours. So if you want to get to know them and you want to have some one to one time with them, go and visit them where they work and understand a little bit about what drives them and how and how their professional work um, impacts upon their role as a governor. When you're beginning to think about the areas that are the priorities for you in your development plan, you can invite individuals to adopt one part of the plan so that they have one thing that they're particularly interested in and get to know really well. Um, invite governors, but also business and community lead leaders to come and meet you for a working breakfast to talk about the school. And a really obvious one, those people who live next door to your building, don't be afraid to build a relationship with them as well. So get them into the carol concert, invite them in for an afternoon tea, invite them into a school production or something like that. But, but those people who live in the community who will see 
your school in action because they they see the children walk past their front door every day those are really important people in terms of building a relationship with and sometimes we, we forget about those and then to finish with um if all of that works for you as well as the things that you want to do my final slide hopefully talks about where where you might want to be by day 100 so first of all you'll have a plan for the next 100 days that'll be important You'll certainly have a very clear picture that you can describe about what's worked and what hasn't. You'll certainly be clear about what the content and the context, importantly, for the development plan will be as you go forward from there. Um, as you're talking about the next year group coming up and the next round of staff appointments that you're making, you'll have some tangible evidence of what you can describe to people about how your school is functioning. Um, and also you'll have that live experience that you can share with a variety of stakeholders and colleagues and other people new to the sector about what it's like to run a free school from scratch on day one. So I hope that's been helpful. Um, I'll stop there and have, hand, hand back and happily answer any questions if I can. Thank you, Sir David. I'll um, just uh, make a few reflections whilst people uh, type their questions or pop their um, virtual hands up for, for anything they'd like to um, pick Sir David's brains about. Um, that was a really, really fantastic session. Um, a few bits particularly I couldn't agree more with. Um, I loved your quote, um, collaboration is the oxygen of school improvement. And I think one thing I talk about often is how the um, leaders that are attracted to running a free school have a real passion for collaboration. Um, and I'm sure you will all share that. And as Sir David pointed out, um, we, uh, you know, run the New Schools Network, so um, are here to to kind of help you at every step of the way and equally free school leaders really feel that civic responsibility to share what they're doing um, with their wider communities and again to echo that importance um, in those first hundred days for you to take a moment to reflect and celebrate your own success there will be hundreds of decisions and um, unforeseen scenarios that you will be in every single day and um, it's really important to take the time to step back and bolster yourself by thinking what did I do well today because it's all too easy to focus on um, the problems or the challenges or what you need to sort out next so I agree that's critical and also the importance of all of that um, feedback from your people on the ground whether that's pupils and parents um, so I mean we are a sufficiently small group um, that if anyone would like to clarify um, or ask a question if you want to just pop your hand up and um, I will uh, come to you and you can ask it um, but in the meantime we have thank you Tracy we have a question from um, Tracy which is as a special school my young people will be traveling up to an hour to school on school transport this means I will not ever see parents carers on the school gates are there further strategies that would work to engage them fantastic question yeah, Tracy, that's a great question. I was very conscious when I was even saying that, that 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 wouldn't necessarily work in every single setting. So I, I think there are, and I think some of the, I think my answer is framed about some of the learning we've seen from what's happened during the pandemic, where the, where the power of a, of a video blog to parents is really really helpful. Um, and and I should have said that actually that, that I've seen more and more examples of that. Um, because uh, there are lots of ways to build that face-to-face -face trust and confidence with parents as well as face-to-face -face. Uh, and I think that notion of, of how of how we do that I I do like the idea of, of newsletters I think bulletins are really helpful but but it does create a, a, an additional burden on you to write it and them to read it and I think there's real power in, in, in a short maybe a disciplined three or four minute video blog once a week uh, to, to do some some of that because it still gives you the opportunity to show some of the kids work off it still gives you an opportunity to say some of those messages i talked about in the assemblies so i think i think i'd probably go down, down that route and, and as hannah says in the chat that she's got some of that hurt that experience in, in a new special school already so i hope that helps and and, and it's a good it's a good question yeah hannah um and hannah jackson tell me if if we need to, to um, move on but hannah seeing as the questions come up please do would you um, be kind enough to chip in with your the particular strategies that you've tried in your special school yeah absolutely so we're based in devon um and we cover pretty much half of the county so we've got a period of uh, travel that a lot of our young people are involved in we also opened in 2019 so we hit covid in march and pretty much have developed our school community over the context of the covid pandemic so for us we've done three things that have been really helpful the regular surveys as Sir david spoke about but we've also done those hosted events via teams um, and used other video platforms and actually that's been really well engaged uh, engaged parents 
works really well, particularly those who can't um, uh, travel that far, because actually that travel challenge isn't just about COVID. It's also about some of the family contexts that we um, have in our, our wider school family. So um, the other key bit has been about pairing up um, families. So we run three hubs of family contact in our three key areas. So what we're doing is we're introducing um, peer parents basically through our family support network that allow for those conversations to be had and then one person to feed back to me as head um, if they feel that there's something that, that I should know or that if there's a worry or concern they'll signpost that to the relevant member of staff. So I think figuring out how to break your big geographical area up into smaller bits using technology but also using people power in those local communities is a really helpful way of moving that forward because it is a challenge there's no doubt about that. Thanks Hannah and I'm sure some bits there for mainstream colleagues for, for the families that are harder to engage um, anyway. Um, any um, further questions for Sir David about any of his fantastic presentation? I think um, I, I had one, if, um, if I may, um, and I think it um, is kind of quite fundamental. So the, the first 100 days are going to be very busy for everybody. So um, in terms of that, the tension between the vision and the mission and the operational demands, um, what, what uh, tips do you have for uh, people other than the reflection journal to um, kind of take themselves out of that operational day-to-day -to, -day to kind of hold firm to their mission and their visions, David? So I saw a really good example of this. Um, it's a couple of years ago now, uh, and, it, 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 and I, think I think it answers your question. So, so what, the, what the head did was, was each, each half term, uh, what she did was she agreed the, 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 the cultural thing that she was going to look at. So may, maybe it was around rewards, for example, or maybe it was around just broader celebration of success, or maybe it was about seeing children being kind to each other. So something, something quite broad like that. And what she did in the staff room was she put that up on a, on a large piece of brown paper. And then as the half term unfolded, as teachers saw examples of that happening, they, they stuck the little white yellow stickets up below it. And what you had was almost like a collage of this culture beginning to build week by week. And, and, and I like that because it kind of blended with something that was really significant, so significant and important about how you set up a new school and particularly in that particular school's culture that it was trying to create. But then people are given the opportunity to provide the evidence that it was happening. Because one of the things that's difficult for us sometimes, I think when we're, when we're leaders, is that we sometimes think about um, the big picture because that's our job, but we, we, we can't be in every classroom at the same time. So we rely on other people to give us examples of it's working. So I think something like uh, the idea about how do you take a big, a big theme like um, how children behave to each other, how do we give feedback, what, what does good look like in our, in our new school, amplified by individual examples from members of staff. I think it's quite a neat way to do that. And it's quite a lovely way to start a meeting by, by going over to the board. I used, you know, I used to do staff briefings every morning and, and I'm sure you do that as well. And, and you just look at the new ones that have arrived and, and it just gives you an insight into what's really happening on the ground. Thank you. That sounds like a, a really lovely visual tool and very, very motivating. Um, we've got time for one um, final qu question from Tracy again. Thank you. Um, first hundred days will be, we will be in interim accommodation um, and you might not be alone there. Um, parents are struggling to see what they are buying into as nothing to look around. Currently, no staff other than me to speak to. Um, so I guess any tips around how to manage that um, in terms of um, selling your vision when it's it's just yourself? Well, the, the answer is in the question in a way, because if you've if if the vision is is not supported by a building or, or something more sub substantial than that, then the vision is you. And, and what you're doing is you're selling yourself. Um, you know, the reality about open evenings, if, if you're a head teacher standing in front of a group of parents who are thinking about sending their child to your school, we've all done it. We talk about the vision for our school. We talk about our exam results. We talk about our offsets. But fundamentally, as a parent, they're, they're working out whether they trust you with their child. 
Um, and, and so that, that ability to put a little bit of yourself out there to build that confidence that you are not just a great educationist and a great leader, but actually a person that's going to really understand the needs of their child. I think that that's, that's it. In, in, in some respects, I think it's easier to build that relationship with parents when you don't have a shiny building behind you. And I've seen lots of examples where the shiny building has come along on day one of a new school or an academy opening up. And actually what happened was the old behaviours just came into the new building and, and, and they missed the opportunity to make that change really happen. So I think part of the answer is it, it, it is down to you as a leader. You, you, you build that relationship so that when, when the new building or whatever it is comes along, um, it's, it's an add on to what they've already bought into. So I, I think that that ability to buy into you personally, that ability to buy into your vision for the school is really an, it, part of that contract that we make with parents. Absolutely agree. Thank you, um, Sir David and Tracy. You'll be in a breakout session later um, with Hannah and I'm sure she might have some uh, other tips uh, for your particular context too. Um, well, thank you again. Um, and Pleasure. I will hand over um, to Hannah for the next portion of the event. Thank Thanks you. everybody, have a good day. Thanks Sophie and thank you very much, Sir David. I'm sure that was really uh, insightful for, for all of us.